Perhaps you remember that when we were in Konya, we spoke of the Seljuk rulers who had their capital there. That Seljuk state was actually a part of a Seljuk empire which stretched right over to Persia. The arrival of the Seljuk Turks had meant that the Byzantine Empire lost, roughly speaking, the eastern half of Anatolia. However, the Seljuk rulers, who had a good press in terms of their tolerance, patronage of the arts, and skill at commerce, etc., were bowled out in 1243 when the Mongols, thought to be descendants of Genghis Khan, arrived in force. We have now arrived in Bursa. The Mongols, after totally trashing the place, soon afterwards withdrew from the field as briskly as they had arrived, and the eastern half of Anatolia was left with many, many states ruled by local chieftains. So we are stood now right in front of our hotel, and this statue of Osman I reminds us that one of these mini-states was ruled by the Osmanli Turks. We are now going to be taken in the bus up the hill to the covered bazaar next to the big mosque, and then walk back from there. The mini-state in this area, with its borders touching those of the Byzantine Empire, was ruled by a chap called Ertegrul. Ertegrul's son, Osman, expanded and strengthened the principality, and his son, Ohan, captured Bursa in 1326 and moved its capital here. Bursa had been a fashionable health resort for the Byzantines, but it is now known as the first capital of the Ottoman Empire. We've now arrived at the covered market, which I think used to be a caravanserai. It reminded me and my two friends from home Firth of the Peace Hall at Halifax. Bursa has for centuries been a centre of the silk weaving industry and if you wanted to buy a present for your managing director then you could find a lovely scarf here which is also easy to carry. Bursa today is a bustling manufacturing town. It has Turkey's largest car factory, it also makes bathtubs, clothing, knives, artillery pieces for the army, and much more. So now let's have a look at the mosque. This is the Grand Mosque, built, I am told, around 1400 in the early Ottoman style, but having many elements carried over from the Seljuk era. There are 192 monumental wall inscriptions made by the famous calligraphers of the period. The 20 domes let in the light. Unfortunately, we don't have time on our lightning tour to see the really famous mosques such as the Green Mosque or the mausoleums of Osman, his son, Orhan, or that of Orhan's wife. There is much else to explore here, and we certainly don't have time to go up Mount Olympus, even by the cable car. If one had more time, possibly on a future visit, one could even from here visit Iznik, which used to be called Nicaea, and Izmit, which used to be called Nagomedia, names which may ring a bell. But on this occasion, we have to try to keep up with Iran on our way back to the hotel. So we're on our way to Istanbul, which is exactly what the Osmanlis had in mind 
except in their day it was called Constantinople. It took them over a century to get there, but the big city lured them on as it lures us today. The Osmanlis, however, had to take a more circuitous route. To get to the eastern end of the Bosphorus Bridge and then cross into Istanbul, we're having to take a ferry across this inlet. Now, Aran is explaining to us here that the best figs come from round here and end up in Marks and Spencers. As of the Black Bursa crop reaches MNS stores. And as category manager, Shazat Rahman. Who is Shazat Rahman? It's not a Turkish name. Shazat points out. The edible fig was one of the first plants to be cultivated by men, particularly in the Mediterranean area. So, back in the 14th century, the Byzantines and the Ottomans rubbed along as neighbors but kept a wary eye on each other. There may have been border skirmishes testing each other's strength, but mainly they rubbed along, as is evidenced by the fact that Orhan's wife was a Byzantine princess. It is possible that Ottomans were employed as mercenaries by the Byzantines to defend Constantinople. But this closer look at the big city merely increased the attraction of the idea of taking it. Before long, Orhan crossed the Bosphorus and proceeded to conquer Thrace, the land to the west of Constantinople. His son Murat I, 1359-89, added Serbia, Bulgaria and Macedonia to the Ottoman Empire. So Constantinople was now in effect surrounded and this is where it's relevant to mention again that fourth crusade we spoke about right at the start of part one. The Venetians had been given permission to trade in Constantinople and a substantial population of Venetians now lived there. North of the Golden Horn, an area we'll have a look at later. Now apparently the people of Constantinople didn't show enough respect to these Phoenicians and over the years a fair amount of resentment had built up in Venice. The Venetians intended sometime to get their own back. The fact that the two were trade rivals and that Venice wanted to take over the east-west trade may have had something to do with it as well. The Fourth Crusade was a godsend, to coin a phrase. Venice was asked to provide the ships to transport the Crusade to the east. Then came that sudden diversion when the Venetian admiral took them up to Constantinople, promising them, of course, a share in the booty. These people overpowered Constantinople, no doubt killing or in other ways abusing lots of the inhabitants in the process. They also stripped the place bare. Anything movable was carried off, mainly back to Venice. Even those big horses on St. Mark's Basilica in Venice came from here. I always get a funny sort of smile when I hear Venetians moaning that Napoleon pinched a few pictures from them. He did actually pinch those big horses as well and took them to Paris, but the Venetians got them back. Well, as you can see, that story has brought us nicely up to the Bosphorus Bridge. But the point of putting this story in here is that Constantinople 
never really recovered from this. The capture of Constantinople by the Osmanlis may still have come about, but it would have been a more difficult proposition. Constantinople fell in 1453. The Venetian who thought up this cunning plan and organized it died soon afterwards in Constantinople. We may see his resting place later. Incidentally, with regard to the relationship between the Byzantines and the Osmanlis, the Byzantines, I think, were probably, at least initially, quite keen to establish a settled relationship with the Osmanlis because they believed that the prospect of being attacked by forces representing the Rome-dominated Western Church was more serious. The Roman Church regarded them as heretical deserters. It seems to me that the Byzantines had been right to have this fear. It's now next morning and we are heading downtown for our walking tour of Istanbul. Istanbul, not Constantinople, Istanbul. <laughs> Thank you, Aran, we'll let you know. The day after tomorrow, the 29th of October, is Turkey's National Day, Republic Day. These decorations are in preparation for that. Now, in a couple of seconds, make sure that you have a look at Valen's aqueduct, because we don't find it again. Emperor Valen's had an older aqueduct rebuilt in the 4th century. Now, here's Ivor again, and here's Kaiser Bill's fountain. We're in the Hippodrome area, and it's raining. And any time now, it's going to be absolutely teeming down. So what you see here is about all the video I got that day. And we're supposed to be going on a boat cruise on the bus rest now. Incidentally, that aqueduct we just saw delivered, and maybe still does deliver for all I know, water to an underground cistern, which we'll see later. Just look at this, it's like a fountain. Sounds as if somebody's enjoying it anyway. 